Good morning, everyone. So happy to have you all joining us this morning. We were just chatting about our working from home situations with our pets in the background and curious to know if any of you working from home have any pets at home and what breed they are, what kind of pets you have. Um, I have a bird and a rabbit, so a little more unique. Uh -huh. What about you, Laura? Yeah, I've got a dog. She's currently locked out of this room so she doesn't come and crash the webinar while we're talking. <laughs> And I have a cockapoo. It's a cocker spaniel mixed with a poodle. She's like medium size and pretty sassy dog. <laughs> I'm currently petless, so I live through <laughs> others, other safer's pet <laughs> pictures. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we do have a back channel on Slack with safe pet pictures. It's pretty adorable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really Definitely bright a good way today. to start off the day. All right, well, we are at that 8 a.m. mark. Uh, why don't we go ahead and kick things off? Great. Uh, we turn off our cameras? Yeah, I think we can probably turn off our cameras now, just to save some bandwidth. All right, uh, good morning, everyone, um, or afternoon or evening, wherever you may be. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this uh, webinar on how to power up your BI with geospatial data. So I'm joined today by Laura and Kezia. Would you like to introduce yourselves? For sure. Yeah, my name is Laura Wu. So I'm um, the team lead for our um, FME server technical support team here at SAFE. So I'm excited to show you a few things that FME server can help with when it comes to working with BI. And I'm Kezia Yu. I'm a technical support specialist as well for the FME server side, and I work on Laura's team. And my name is Dar Broderick, and I'm part of the FME desktop team here at Safe Software. For our agenda today, we're going to kick things off by taking a look at an introduction to FME and BI tools. Uh, getting your spatial data into a BI tool, using webhooks to provide real-time updates to data in your BI tools, working with high-volume data streams, and we also have some resources for you to uh, take away after the webinar to continue your learning of FME and BI. For those of you that are new to the term uh, BI, uh, BI is short for business intelligence, and business intelligence analyzes uh, data generated by a business and presents easy to digest reports, performance measures, and trends that inform and add to the decision making process. Business intelligence tools are the types of applications or software that collect and process large amounts of unstructured data from internal and external systems and visualize the data in a manner that allows for effective decision making. So we just had an example of some BI tools that we're going to take a look at today. Um, so at the end of the day, a BI tool is anything that can help you make better decisions within your business. And how can location intelligence, location data, or geospatial data, however you'd like to phrase it, uh, help with the decision making process? So by combining your business data with geospatial information, this can provide important context to your data and can help unlock new insights that can benefit your business. But working with geospatial data is not always that easy. It can be hard to centralize the data and make it accessible to your BI tool. Some obstacles that we've seen include um, that is often, data is often stored away in silos where people are unable to obtain it and use it to its full potential. Um, it's often spread across multiple formats, which often don't interact well with one another or even just located in a different coordinate system. And this is where FME can help. So, the FME data integration platform has the best support for spatial data in the industry. FME makes it possible to bring a multitude of different data sources together, uh, which can then be utilized by your BI tools, making the process easier than ever before. 
And that really sums up our mission here at Safe Software. We want to help you maximize the value of your data. A little bit more about us here at Safe for any newcomers uh, to the webinar. We have been solving uh, data challenges in the industry for over 25 years. We're trusted by over 10,000 organizations across 128 countries around the globe. And we have a wide ranging partner support network. So you can be sure wherever you're based that there will be someone there to support you. The FME data integration platform includes FME desktop, where you will build your workflows, FME server, which can be used to automate the workflows that you have created in FME desktop, as well as utilizing powerful tools like automations, schedules, and triggers. And then finally, we have FME Cloud, which is basically FME Server, but it's hosted by uh, Safe Software. Before we get into the demos, here's a look at the kind of formats that FME supports. Starting back in 1995 with GIS and CAD data, uh, through the years, more and more formats have been added, like uh, Point Cloud, BI, and we've even started to venture into the world of AR, VR, um, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. So it's really exciting times for the for the company. We're going to take a look at preparing our spatial data for uh, BI. And to do so, we're going to use FME Desktop. So as I mentioned before, FME Desktop is where you will author and build your workflows using um, an intuitive uh, interface uh, with support for over 450 formats and even more considering the connection to APIs and uh, web services. Um, FME is really amazing that it's a no code um, environment. But should you actually want to extend the power of FME, you can do so by using um, R or Python. So some of the BI tools that we'll take a look at today include uh, Tableau, which we have the Hyper Writer, uh, Click, which we have the Click.json uh, Reader, and the Click Data Exchange Writer. And finally, we have a web connection to Power BI. Okay, so for our first demo, we're going to look at um, prepping some spatial data for our BI tool, which will be uh, Tableau. So the goal here is to introduce uh, FME Desktop, uh, validate our data, enrich the spatial data, and then write out to Tableau. So some of the obstacles that we will encounter here is want to remove any uh, bad data, because your BI tool is really only as good as the data that uh, it uses. So if you have um, bad data going in, you're going to get bad data going out. And so the solution here is to use FME Desktop to perform uh, data validation and clean up um, and then write out to Tableau. Okay, so I'm just going to jump over to FME Desktop where I have uh, just a fresh new workspace open here. And I'm going to begin by bringing in uh, some business license uh, information in the form of a CSV file. So if I take a look at the parameters here, I can see we have like business name, when it was issued, and we also have a latitude and longitude. So FME is intelligent enough to uh, pick up that these will be X and Y coordinates. And we'll see oh, that matters in a second now once we read this in. So we can see on our visual preview down here, FME has created a point for each uh, business license in this CSV file. If we scroll across, we can see that some of these business licenses are actually missing some, um, some latitude and longitude uh, information. So we'd like to filter these out. So we could use a geometry filter to remove any of these business licenses without a point. And select point. 
And once that has run through, you can see we have 731 businesses without a point. So I'd like to write this um, data out to say an Excel file for data cleanup in the future. I'm just uh, select where I would like to write this in file name. So just call this data cleanup. And I'm going to set the schema to just automatic. It just keeps all the columns. And I'm just going to name my sheet missing last. And connect up my stream. Okay. So once, uh, once I'm ready to run my workspace. This will create an Excel file, which uh, someone on the team can look at for to maybe look into assigning these uh, Latin long coordinates to these business licenses. So next thing I'd like to do is use an attribute validator. I want to make sure that all of the businesses have a postal code. So I can use something like the attribute validator. Select my attribute, which is going to be the postal code and validation rule, I want to make sure that it has a value. Okay, and once we run this through, you can see that there's 33 businesses that are actually missing their postal code. So again, I can just add another uh, feature type here to my um, Excel writer and say, call this missing postal code. And this will create another sheet in that Excel file uh, so someone can look at maybe assigning these uh, postal codes. Okay, so next thing I would like to do is just use an attribute manager to assign some conditional values to some of the attributes in that we're working with. So like the, um, you can see we have like a business display name and we also have, have a business trade name, but in some cases, their the business trade name is missing or the business name is missing. So I just want to set something up to ensure that we always have a business name associated with with each uh, license. I'd also like to ensure that the fee paid, if it's um, not been paid, that it's set to zero dollars. So I can set up a conditional value in here to do so. So I'm just going to grab that fee paid attribute, and I want to ensure that the if the attribute is an empty string, it will be set to zero and zero, so zero dollars. And then I'm just going to set up an, another attribute here. So business uh, display name and use the set up another conditional value in here. But if the business trade name has a value, I can then use that business trade name. And if it doesn't, we can use the uh, business name. You can also use the attribute manager there to change the the um, volume names um, or remove any attributes that you don't want to use. Okay, so I can see that we have um, all these points, but I also have a shapefile with the neighborhoods in Vancouver. Once I read this in, we'll just take a look. Okay, so I can see I have my shapefile, but it looks like it's somehow located in the wrong coordinate system. So this is another thing that FME can do is we can set the coordinate system using a coordinate system setter. And this should bring us back to the right location. So as we take a look at this, you can see that um, now my uh, shapefile is located in the right area with the Vancouver background map in the, in the background. So I'd like to uh, see how many licenses are in each neighborhood in Vancouver. So I could use a point on area over there. It's just one example of what uh, transformer that we could use. And I can connect up my streams. So put these up. And I'm just going to call the um, output attribute uh, number of businesses. And click OK. 
once I take a look at the shape files here or the polygons, I can see that in let's say Mount Pleasant we have 585 licenses. Now that our uh, data is ready, I'm just going to write this out to Tableau using the Tableau hyper writer. So I specify my output file. So I'm just going to call this Vancouver. Uh, yeah, that should do. And so for the geometry, I'm going to set this first one to point and just call it a table business loop. Make that up. And then I'm going to add another feature type for our neighborhood polygons. So the table name, we'll just call this um, boundary. We're going to set this to polygon. Connect this up. And finally, yeah, I think we're good to go. We can write all our, we can run our workspace, and that's going to create our Excel file and our Tableau hyper file. So jumping into Tableau, I'm going to open up the hyper file. There we go. I'm just going to drag my two tables in. And this really makes it a lot easier um, compared to our previous writer, which is the TDE writer. Uh, so in here, I can start to build my dashboards. I'm going to add the uh, latitude and the longitude. So this is for the business license first. You can see we just get one point here so far, which is obviously not what I want. I just need to make sure that this aggregate measures option is uh, unticked. And then that will show me all the licenses here in um, Vancouver. I'd like to be able to see the status of these licenses. So if I drag that in onto the color here, you can see this will color each license depending on the status. So I can see the ones that are issued, pending if they're gone out of business or if they're inactive. Jumping onto just another sheet here, I can start to use the boundaries that we created. So if I click on this uh, geography attribute here and zoom all the way in, let me just give this a second to reset. I know it doesn't look right exactly right now. So if I go to analysis and unaggregate this again, that and zoom all the way in again. Let's get our uh, polygons. So you can see I had each individual polygon, but I need to just bring in the say like the map ID or the name, so I can see each neighborhood. So you can see Kitsilano downtown, um, and then I want to bring in the number of businesses also. So I'll be able to see how many licenses have been assigned to each uh, neighborhood in Vancouver. And finally, I could just do something else like color these and the number of businesses like I did with the, um, uh, like in the previous example, and then we can really see where uh, the most businesses are in Vancouver. Obviously this is gonna be the downtown area of uh, Vancouver. And that's just like a really simple example of how you could create a visualization in a BI tool and how you're going to write your data out and if you need to enrich the data or anything uh, like that. And that kind of sums up that demo. Um, so what did we learn here? So we learned how FME handles data with a spatial element, uh, how to perform that data cleanup or data validation, and then how to write out to uh, tableau and to create these uh, visualizations okay so we also have like an example that's um a little bit more advanced so in this example which was created by nathan hildebrand for a webinar back in 2019 um so this demo is really great for showcasing the power and capabilities of uh, fme desktop and a little bit of fme server as well so in this example, um, Nathan looks at the continuous drive times for all locations to the nearest clinic in the Syracuse area of uh, New York. So you can see that in the, on this dashboard in click, it almost has like a heat map type of effect uh, where the red areas indicate a short drive time, uh, blue areas indicate a longer drive time. So 
in this Cleveland area here, you can see we're the past 30 minutes to the nearest plane. While if we move into this area here, you're only three minutes away from the clinic. Uh, so FME was used to um, enrich the underlying data also with demographic information for the areas, which includes like the population, the age, and um, the percentage with and without health insurance. So this uh, spatial data shows us wherever you may be based, how long it's going to take you to drive to a clinic. But it also answers the question of where do we need more clinics to best serve the population of um, Syracuse. And if we just jump over to the workspaces in FME, I, I'll try to give you a, a high level um, explanation of how Nathan achieved this. Uh, so there was a few different steps and a few different workspaces. So accessing the data through like web portals and APIs, there was uh, data validation of the road networks, ensuring that the clinics are snapped to the road network when the data is validated. Uh, the next stage is to build like spatial relationships between the clinics and the roads. There was some cost analysis to calculate uh, drive times and along those uh, road networks, and then enriching the spatial data with US census information. There was even some uh, raster interpolation in the last workspace before they write the data out to the click uh, dashboard. Um, so this is a really high level like explanation of how Nathan achieved this. If you'd like a, a kind of better view of how he achieved this, I'd really recommend checking out the um, webinar that he uh, did this in, uh, which we'll have a link to in the resources, and it's also linked in the uh, presentation. So uh, I'm just going to pass over to Kezia now. Awesome. So thank you, Dara. I'll just take it from here on to the next demo, which is using webhooks to provide real-time updates to data in BI tools. So this demo aims to showcase the workflow from taking an API, extracting the data in FME desktop, publishing the workspace to FME server to create a webhook, and visualizing the data in Power BI. API stands for Application Programming Interface and is a service that allows two applications to talk to each other. In this demo, we'll be working with Google Developers Places API. The Places API is a service that returns information about places using HTTP requests. Places are defined within this API as establishments, geographic locations, or prominent points of interest. The main obstacle in this demo is to have the most current data streamed into Power BI. We're solving this by creating a webhook in FME server. A webhook is a way to get real-time information sent from one application to another. Once an action has been completed by the application, it can send information to the other one via the webhook. So through FME, the webhook can deliver the data into Power BI as a URL. Let me just show you what this looks like. So before I get into the bulk of the demo, I just wanted to give a little brief overview about the Google Maps Platform Places API. You'll need to create your own billing account so that you can get a token for this API key. There are maps, routes, and places, and we'll be focusing on the places. So we can show you what the documentation looks like. And here is the tab for usage and billing that you can definitely check out. So for me, I would like to look at vet clinics around the Vancouver area. That would be the places or points of interest for me. So here is the documentation for nearby search places API. This seems like a highly relatable topic as many of us may have pets or adopted over COVID. So what I can do to build out this API or this request URL is to go through the documentation. You can see the output is either JSON or XML and some required parameters would be the location, which is the latitude and longitude. And for me, it would be Vancouver. So I can just Google that really quickly. And then there are other parameters that are optional. If we scroll down, we can see an example on how to build out this request URL. And for example, their keyword is cruise, their location is the lat long of their area, and the radius would be 1500 meters, and the type is restaurant, and then they would have their key. 
And if you scroll down a little further, you'll see that the JSON returned has a lot of information that we might not necessarily need. So let me just show you quickly the request URL that I built out for vet clinics around Vancouver in this tab right here. As you can see, we have the JSON output, the location, this is a Latin long of Vancouver that I grabbed from Google, and I set the radius to 10,000 meters, and my keyword is vet. And I hid my key, but because you'll have your own if you set yours up. And here is the JSON returned body. And as you can see, there's a lot of information that we don't necessarily need to bring into Power BI. So that's where FME Desktop comes in. So let's open up our FME Workbench. And to bring in this API request URL, we can start with the creator transformer just to start off the translation. And then with the HTTP caller transformer. And you can connect it. And this is where you will paste in the URL that we built out and using the get method because you are receiving information from Google. And because I have this workspace already built out, I'll just scroll right up and walk you through it. So if we run this uh, HTTP call transformer, we can see that the response body is very exactly the same as what we saw in the web browser earlier. And we wanna extract the JSON information that we want. For example, I probably just want the name, whether or not the establishment is open, the rating, as well as the location, such as the geometry and so on. So to do so, I use the JSON fragmenter transformer to take out, to extract the JSON that I want which is in the results and the attributes that I want to expose are geometry, name, place ID, vicinity, which is the address, the rating of the establishment, and whether or not it's open. So we can run that through and you can see that we have new attributes in the table with the rating, vicinity, but the geometry and the opening hours are still within JSON and in the deeper level for the lat long to come out. So we would require more JSON fragmenters to parse them out. And finally, so we have the lat long out here, as well as whether or not they're open. And then to put them on a map, we can use the Vertex creator. And you can see they're in the middle of the ocean because they're not set to the proper coordinate system. And to do so, we have the coordinate system setter which will bring them back onto land. Awesome. And finally, I use the attribute manager to clean out the data a little bit better, add some capitalization and renamed vicinity to address just for greater clarity. And then I finally wrote out to a CSV file. So now that this workbench and workflow is working, I'm gonna publish it onto FME server to get the webhook so that I can bring it into Power BI. To do so, you just select the publish to FME server button right up here and go through the wizard. I already have it published up here. So if I click next, it will ask if I want to update, I'll say yes. And I wanna focus on the data streaming service. And once we publish that up, we can go into FME server from the link below. And so, here is the repository that we put our workspace in. Just as we ran the workspace in desktop, we can run this workspace on FME server. And I'm using the data streaming service. Let's give that a run. And here we have a CSV file downloaded onto our computer. So the next thing is to create the webhook. And to do so, you would go back into the run a workspace page and select advanced and go into create a webhook. In the create a webhook page, select okay. And then you wanna download the information because this is where you'll get your access token information. And it's very important that you keep that safe. So what we need is the authorization with query string URL, copy that. You can paste it in your web browser just to confirm that the webhook works and it does. So I ran the workspace and downloaded the CSV file once again. Let's bring this into Power BI Desktop. So this is 
Power BI desktop. And since we have all our data cleaned up and transformed, we just need to put it in via this button, get data, and then web, and paste in our webhook. Select OK. And basically, the webhook uh, ran the workspace on FME server and downloaded the CSV into Power BI. And so we can load that in. From here, it's just basic Power BI visualization. If you want to use a map, you just grab in the lat, latitude, and longitude, and you can get your points going and build out your report from here. So I already have a report built out. So here it is. And so here is the information that I wanted to show in my report, which include the rating of the animal hospitals in Vancouver and whether or not they're open. So it looks like the best animal hospital in Vancouver is Point Grey Veterinary Hospital, and you can check them out if you want the best service. Um, and the great thing about this is that you can refresh the data. Currently, they, they all true. This is from last night as I, I haven't refreshed it yet, but it is still a little early in Vancouver, so they might not all be open. So let's refresh the data. And you can see some of them are open, but not all. A little bit changed. So not too bad. There are a lot that are open if you do need. And then final step would be publishing onto Power BI Web, which is in File, Publish, and you can publish up here. Once again, I have that published already, so I'll just jump to that right now. And the option of refreshing your, the webhook on the web works as well, or you can schedule the refresh here. I don't have the capability with my licensing, but I just wanted to show you guys where you can do this. And here is the report on the web. And then you can make it interactive. And that about sums up my demo. A little quick recap on what we demoed just now. We started with a Google API to build out the request URL. We used um, FME Desktop to extract JSON output and write it to a CSV. And then we published the workspace to FME Server to create a webhook. With this webhook, we used it as a web URL for data source in Power BI. And we visualized in Power BI to showcase what we have. And you can refresh for up-to-date data. So this workflow can definitely be replicated with different data sources, such as your own databases, your own APIs, and information that is important to you and your business. And all you would need is FME Desktop, FME Server, and your favorite BI tool. I'd also like to mention that part of this workflow was adapted from a fellow FME user, so you can definitely check out his LinkedIn post on his workflow in the link below. And I guess I can pass it on to Laura with the final demo. Right. Thanks, Kezia. Yeah, so for this last section here, I just want to talk about just a slightly different type of data source that we can connect to with FME. Um, so just looking at data streams. So when I talk about data streams in this context, I basically mean data that um, a high, like high volume data. So you're getting information at a very frequent rate. You know, you're getting um, hundreds of messages a second, for example, um, being able to pull data from sensors. So a lot of this streaming data comes from the Internet of Things, uh, frequently sensor data. So you have, you know, there's sensors everywhere these days, uh, always sending out large volumes of messages, measuring everything from, you know, like temperature sensors, uh, weather reports, um, flood monitoring, and GPS locations, so tracking vehicle fleets and things like that. Uh, the data is valuable, and it's very important for uh, businesses to be able to kind of keep track and be able to use that and manage it. But the volume can be a little overwhelming, depending on the, the number of things that you're monitoring all at once. So how do you deal with that? So if you're dealing with you know, hundreds of messages every second, you're going to have millions of records to process you know, within a couple of days um, very quickly. So you don't necessarily want to be loading you know, a billion records into a single view inside a, a business intelligence tool. Uh, perhaps you'd like a way to be able to kind of filter that data down and only keep the, the pieces that are important to you um, and also be able to clean that up and adjust it as it goes through. So I'll show in this example, 
uh, an example of using um, location data streaming within FME to be able to kind of adjust the data and bring it into a business intelligence tool. Uh, so here we are collecting and analyzing data from GPS sensors on a vehicle fleet. Uh, for the purpose of this demo, it's all simulated information, uh, but we are tracking thousands of vehicles traveling on the streets in the city of Vancouver. Uh, the obstacles here, there's a lot of data. You don't necessarily want to keep it all. Um, these GPS sensors are collecting data every five seconds for each of the vehicles that we're tracking. And that's great, but you know, a vehicle's not exactly going to move very far in five seconds, we hope. It's not moving that fast. Uh, so we're going to summarize that data just to get it uh, into less frequent time windows. So we'd like to maybe look at it every couple minutes or something like that. The other issue is that these GPS locations aren't always accurate. Uh, so especially when these vehicles are driving through, say, the downtown core with lots of buildings and that, uh, the signal can kind of bounce around and you'll get some weird results where you'll have you know, a bus in the middle of the inlet or something like that. So we'd like to be able to adjust this data uh, to figure out where these points are supposed to be and match them to the nearest roads. So we know which vehicles are on which roads at any given time. So the result we're hoping is to have some filtered, cleaned, and enhanced data, and being able to process that in real time as the information is sent and collect that into a database behind the scenes so we can use that to analyze. So we'll hop into a demo for this. So I'll start off in Workbench here. So I've got my workspace. It's very small, don't worry, just giving you an idea of what it looks like here. There's a bit going on, but it's not overly complicated. So I'll just zoom into the important pieces here to start. So the first thing here is being able to connect to that stream of information. So here I'm using the Kafka connector. So we have a bunch of different connector transformers in FME to be able to support a lot of different um, services for data streaming. So we have a lot of IoT connectors for Azure, um, Google, Amazon, I think all the big names for that, and tons of other things. We've got JMS and, and lots of other options. So in the Kafka connector here, uh, the key piece I'd like to highlight is this mode. So I'm just gonna zoom in a bit. Uh, we have the mode here set to stream. And what this means is that it's going to connect to this data stream at this host and it's going to maintain an open connection to that stream of information, which means it'll open up a connection. And then as soon as any record arrives from any one of our vehicles that we're tracking, it's going to come straight through this connector into the workspace. So this lets us process the data in real time as it's collected. Uh, this means that this workspace will, since it's maintaining that open connection, the workspace is actually going to be running forever, um, as long as you want to be able to pull in this data and process it. So it's a little bit different from kind of the regular behavior of FME Workbench, where typically you'd connect to a data source, read all the records, process them, and then the workspace closes and finishes. In this case, it never finishes because it never knows that the, all, it has all the records because the records are continually coming in. So we're using a creator transformer in this case to generate a single feature that kicks off the Kafka connector. So I ran this earlier. I don't have it currently running at the moment. Uh, I just ran this for a few minutes and was able to collect about 475,000 records coming through. Uh, the data comes in as JSON, so I'm using a JSON flattener to clean it up. The next piece here was because this data is being collected at a more frequent rate than I really need, uh, we don't need data every second for vehicles that are not moving you know, meters per second themselves. So I'm using this transformer called the time windower to handle that. So what this lets me do is it lets me group the records based on a timestamp. So each of these records, these GPS locations has a timestamp on them for the time that it, the, the data was collected. And I'm gonna use that and collect them into kind of 10 second intervals. So for the purpose of this demo, I didn't run this very long. So I went with 10 seconds, uh, but I could switch this to minutes, hours, or even days, depending on the kind of data I'm working with. So this will assign an attribute called the window ID to each group of records within that 10 second window. Uh, from there, what I'd like to do is get the last location of each vehicle in that window. So in that 10 seconds, if the vehicle has moved much at all, I'd like to get its most recent location for that time window. So I'm using a sampler transformer to handle that. So I'm grouping by the window ID. So for each window ID, and then the path ID, which is actually the vehicle ID in this case. 
I'd like to get the most recent record for each ID in the window. From there, I just do a bit of geometry cleanup, some reprojection, creating a point for each location in that. The next step is to figure out where these points are. So based on the GPS location, which is not necessarily accurate, I'd like to be able to match each point to the nearest road line that they're close to. So that's what's happening up above here. First of all, I'm just taking in some data about the road networks in the city of Vancouver. For the purposes of this example, I'm only interested in major roads, so you know highways or busier streets, not the side streets so much. So I'm just keeping those. I'm also using coordinate system setter to make sure both of these data sets are in the same coordinate space. Uh, if one's in lat long and another one's in UTF, I'm not going to be able to compare them and figure out which is closer, so I need to make sure they are um, in the same coordinate system. And then I'm using a neighbor finder transformer here to figure out which point is closest to which road. So in this case, I can find the closest road, and the maximum distance is set to five units of the coordinate system that the data is in. So that's a little bit tricky, but you have to know your coordinate system and you have to know what kind of units make sense for that one. In this case, I think it's meters, so that would make the most sense. So as long as it's within five meters of a road, we'll assume it's good. Anything that's not, we can kind of filter that off and take a closer look at that. Maybe the GPS location was way off and there's no real way to know exactly where that vehicle was, but we could probably guess it based on its next point later on. Uh, from there, I just do a bit of attribute cleanup, and then I'm writing this data out into a database. For this, I'm using spatial light just for the demo purposes, uh, but when you're dealing with large volumes of data, you probably want to use a database that suits that purpose. So something, you know, there's Google BigQuery, there's a lot of NoSQL um, databases that can handle large volumes of data. There's, there's a lot of different types of databases you could use for that. So it's kind of up to you and what tools you have at hand. So that is the workspace. So this is created now. And what I'd like to do, instead of having this running on my desktop indefinitely, uh, where I could accidentally close it and ruin my entire processing, I'm going to publish this up to FME server to handle running this for me. So I've already published this, so I'll skip that step for now. I'll just head straight into FME server. So because the way this workspace runs is unique, um, we have a different way to manage that within the server interface. So we have the streams interface here. I'm just going to build a stream for this. And this basically just makes it easier for me to configure how this workspace runs and which engine it'll take up. Because it runs forever, it will take up a, a whole engine on your server. Uh, so if you only have one engine and you have other jobs you want to process, it may not be a good fit. But if you've got a couple of engines and you're happy to use one to process this data, that's great. I'll locate my repository and my workspace. So I can say, OK, oops, I did not choose input data sets. I'm just going to skip that for now. I'm not going to run this for real for the time being. So I wanted to show the interface. I set the published parameters. In real life, you'd want to actually point it to correct data sets. Uh, but the key here is the ability to assign an engine to this stream. So I can assign one of the engines from my pool and make this dedicated for running this data stream. So once that's running, it'll be updating my database, and then I can use whatever BI tool I'd like to be able to connect to that data set and create my visualizations and look at the data, um, you know, kind of as a given snapshot at any given moment. And I can always see the most up-to-date information because my workspace is always updating that database and including new data as it comes through. So for this example, I just use Click to show how it can look. Uh, so here's just a, a quick and simple visualization. So I'm showing um, the point data that I collected within that couple of minutes when I ran this workflow. So I can see where all my vehicles are kind of gathering, which streets seem to be the most busy. I can turn off this layer here, and I can show what the road network looks like with a summary of how many um, vehicle points were on each given road segment at any given time. So I can see kind of where the data is collecting and where there might be some traffic where the data, uh, where these vehicles are, are slowing down. Because I set up these time windows, I also can look at time snapshots for this data. So these are all within 10 seconds of each other, but you know I could do this over a couple of days and I can see trends in my data. So at this particular time, this is what my data looked like. But you know, at this time here, a few seconds earlier, you can see things kind of move around a little bit, and I can see snapshots of the data at any point in time. 
And that's it for the demo here. Let me head back to the slideshow. Um, yeah, so the connector transformer is important if you'd like to be able to pull in data from any kind of streaming source. We have a lot of different connectors depending on the kinds of tools that you're working with. Uh, filtering transformers are important if you'd like to be able to reduce the volume of your data, make sure you're only keeping what's important and what is useful. And then make sure to store that clean data in a database somewhere so you can always connect to that and make use of it um, after you've collected that. So just a quick summary of the webinar overall. So we had three main topics that we were looking at today. First one, Dara walked us through uh, just some basics of how FME can help you get your geospatial data under control, being able to filter on geometries, clean things up, do spatial overlays, all that fun stuff. Uh, Kezia showed us how webhooks and FME server can be used to help um, run your data processing workflows on demand directly within your BI tool of choice. And finally, we just looked at using stream connector transformers to be able to connect to high volume data streams. Um, so if you are interested in downloading the FME 2021.2 noise upgrade or get a free trial from our website, uh, the workspaces from this webinar will be available uh, as soon as we make this webinar public on our webpage. So keep an eye out for that as well if there's anything you're interested in diving into more. And yeah, see what you can do. If there's anything here, you can apply within your own systems. Uh, we also have some resources. So there's just a few different articles and webinars uh, that you can check out if you are interested in diving a bit more into any of the topics that we covered today. Awesome. So uh, we do have a community badge for everyone today as a thank you for joining us. So you can visit fme.ly slash webinar badge. And today code is on the screen and I will also leave it in the chat. And yes, we do have some time for Q&A and I will pass it over to our presenters to host the Q&A. Thanks, Hannah. Um, yes, yeah, so we had a few questions during the webinar here we wanted to address live. Um, and if anyone has any other questions that they wanted to ask, feel free to chat or send those through the questions panel as we're answering here. Um, yeah, so just to start, um, there was one question uh, during Dara's demo uh, while he was showing writing to Tableau Hyper. Uh, someone was asking about where in FME you have to go in to modify the feature to tell it whether to write points or polygons or lines. So Dara, did you want to talk to that a little bit? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so in once you've added the Tableau Hyper Writer to your uh, workspace, you can choose the, fe the geometry uh, in the feature type. So you can select from a drop down and then there's uh, points, lines, uh, polygons, or you can select by first feature. Perfect. Hopefully that Thanks. answers the question. Yeah, great. Um, and so a question about webhooks. Uh, so do you or do we require additional licenses to be able to create webhooks within FME? Uh, Kezia, did you want to talk to that? Sure. Um, just to answer that really quickly, you do not need an extra license. Um, once you have FME server, the trial license will get you going to create webhooks off of your workspaces and that will get you going. Perfect, thanks. No problem. Uh, so another one about the refresh in Power BI. So the way you had it set up with the webhook, um, whenever you refresh the data in that dashboard, uh, does that initiate the FME server job each time? How does that work? Yeah, so every time you refresh, click the refresh button in Power BI, it will, uh, reload the uh, webhook and that will run the workspace on FME server and update the CSV output that is in Power BI. Perfect. Okay. And so the last question that we had for during the webinar was, um, so what options does FME offer for statistical and geostatistical analysis? I think Dara, you'd answer that in the panel. So I'll let you talk to it if you want. Yeah, I just found a few links um, to a blog post uh, that we have on 
Uh, sorry, I'm just getting my names here. Statistical analysis via H uh, via FME hub transformers based on R. Uh, so that use utilizes R in FME. And then we also have an article on custom transformers uh, for st statistical analysis. And then we also ha have a transformer called the statistics calculator, which can do some um, basic statistical analysis in FME. So I'll just paste those into the chat for anyone who's interested in taking a look. Okay, so I just see one question came in related to Power BI. Um, so how do you work with line strings in Power BI? Um, so Casey, in your demo, you were showing what kind of geometry types were in that? Points. I was doing points for uh, veterinary hospitals. Okay. But I didn't Did work, get a oh. chance to work with line string. Okay. Yeah. So that's something we could take a look at and follow up with you about. I'm not completely familiar with it myself either. So. Okay, so another question here. So can color coding be manually defined to identify any type of information about a location that you're looking for? Anyone want to take this on? I think we might need a little bit more context for this question. Yeah, I guess specifically which tool you're looking to write your yeah. data into, yeah. Um, so FME does have some transformers that'll let you set the colors for different types of features. Uh, and then depending on the, the the data type that you're writing out to, it may or not it may or may not actually support storing those color values. So it can depend on exactly what you're doing, what you're writing out to, and what tool you'd like to import that into. But I think most pretty much all of the BI tools that we were showing today had tools inside that let you uh, select the colors to use to display the data in there based on values. So you can do that for sure. Okay, I think that's all the questions we had. Anyone have anything else to add? No, that's all for me. Okay, Perfect. that's all for me. Awesome, thanks everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, presenter. So I'm just gonna wrap us up. So yeah, uh, our 2022 user conference is coming in August, very exciting. So you can assess the link to register in the chat and I will chat out the link now. And also please join us at the FME World Tour from March 22nd to June 24th. I will again chat out the link to view the tour schedule and to register now. And also we have um, some upcoming and on-demand webinars on our website. So make sure to check that out. And yes, so um, big thank you to everyone who joined our webinar today and also to our presenters. So after the webinars, there's a survey. So if you have some time to hang around, we always love to see your feedback. And I will also leave the webinar open for a few minutes longer, just in case there's any question or if you want to save any links from the chat panel. And if we are not able to answer your question during the webinars today, uh, we will be sure to follow up with you with an email. And yes, that's it. Hope you all have a great rest of your day and uh, bye for now.